What's going on, beautiful people? Welcome to another episode of the Black Sheep Perspective. Today is Monday the 4th. I'm trying to get better with my dates so I can let you guys know when I have these recordings and I got these beautiful people that come, my guests who, who come, and that way you can you know, stay in track with, with when this happened and how that aligned in case they're saying a certain story or have certain references. And um, anyhow, it's a nice, cool morning, a little gloomy looking, but it's a cool morning. My weekend was dope. I hope everybody had a great one as well. The only thing whack about my weekend and i know a lot of people don't care is my dolphins fucking tanked it when we had a great opportunity to make it into the playoffs everybody's questioning to uh i don't even know what to think about all that i literally that thing stresses me out so i'm gonna leave that alone but on a different note man i have an amazing guest today who happens to be a very close friend of mine who i've known for many years and uh, we've lost contact several times because life gets the best of us it's never anything negative every time we catch back up it's like, whoa, look at, look at what you've been doing. Look at where you're at now. And it's always a great time. And I haven't seen you, been able to sit down with you for probably over a year, almost. I've seen you. Probably more. I, was, I think we crossed paths shortly somewhere. I, I think it was an event. I don't know. It was quick. But we haven't sat down and talked for a minute. For, and we used to do that all the time at work. But people listening, I want everybody to welcome Kendra, and you guys ain't going to believe it, but Kendra Ger Geronimo, like dead-ass Geronimo. That, that should scare you right away. Kendra, welcome to the show, sweetie. Thank you. I'm, I feel really privileged that you asked me to be on it. Ah, uh, man, I, I, I think that you've been doing so much. You know, I, people always ask me, hey, what type of guests are you looking for? And, you know, in the very beginning, I was known for MMA people, and I, and I didn't want that. I, I didn't want I want everybody. I want who grabs my attention and why. I mean, what's, and, you know, what's your story and this and that. Luckily, I've known you for a while, but again, we were talking earlier off cam. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. My voice is a little harsh because I was playing volleyball over the weekend, a whole lot of screaming, and it just happens. But it just got nothing to do with all the smoking I do, by the way. <laughs> but um, we haven't caught up in a long time, and, and, and I'm here following you. Obviously, we follow each other, and we send each other little messages and likes. But you've been making these big moves, and I know we're going to get into details. You know, you, you were starting a, a nonprofit organization that blew my mind. I was like, wow, that's great. Look at what timing. And then I found out, well, wait a minute, this is coming from what? And that really intrigued me because, I mean, we all know each other a decent amount. We think we know each other well. I think we were pretty good friends. We are pretty good friends. And I never knew this story that you told me that it influenced you to you know, start the nonprofit. And we'll get into that. But then I also seen that you were getting real tactical. You were becoming a bad mama jammer. I mean, just slinging bullets left and right, doing tactical stuff that is on another level, like almost like getting ready for any type of scenario, doomsday, war, attackers, who, you know, whatever to be, would be haters, whatever. Um, and that took you also to something dope that you that you experienced that I can't wait to, to, to hear about. And um, I also got really attached to your kids, man. You got two amazing fucking kids. Yeah. You know, the whole gym, every coach knew who your kids were. And they were awesome little studs. And we knew that you had your hands full as a single mother doing what you were doing. And everybody really appreciated your grind and your hustle and the amount of energy you had. You know, so I was like, man, I got to reach out to Kendra. You know, this is a perfect time to reach out to her. Um, I had to pause real quick with actively recording because I was just trying a new system out. I'm still in the process of that. But too much time elapsed and I told my editor, hey, we have to bite the bullet on some editing for a couple of more sessions. I got to reach out to some people. I'm dying to have my homegirl on, man. She's making some big moves, and you're here, man, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have you here, so uh, I really do appreciate you coming. Um, first of all, where are you from, Kendra? Where are you born? Where, where's, where's your ethnicity? Kind of, people watching you, too, they're going to be like, bro, she looks Latin, she looks black, she looks black Latin, she looks Arabian, what the fuck? I get that a lot. I get that. I was actually working a, an all-black event, and they found out later on that I wasn't, and I was like, does that mean I got to go home? <laughs> <laughs> still getting paid, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I could still be here, right? Uh, so I'm Puerto Rican, Dominican. I grew up in the United States. I was born in a military base in Virginia, and between my dad being in the military and my mom just being a, a gypsy, you know, I moved everywhere and lived everywhere, so I have. I feel like I have a little bit of everywhere. Like everyone always tells me, "Well, I can't. I, I can't pick where your accent's from." And I'm like, "Cause I don't think I have one." You right. Know? Or, or I get that I'm asked if I'm from New York because I have an attitude problem. <laughs> who, who was Dominican and who was a uh, Hispanic? I my, mean, who was a uh, Puerto Rican? My dad's Dominican from uh, Washington Heights, and my mom's Puerto Rican from Boston. Who has the darker tint to them? My dad's darker. Your my dad. mom is like super, super white. Is he darker, like? Um, I don't know if I'm saying this loosely, like the, the average Dominican, or is he more on the darker Well, he's Dominican. my complexion. Oh, he's your complexion. Yeah, okay. and my mom is like four shades lighter than you. Blanquita. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's, some, there's a lot of white Puerto Ricans. Yeah, yeah, she's white, black hair. My dad's a dark skin, curly hair, so I guess that's where, you know, the little mixture comes from. Nice, nice. And I, and, and I was completely unaware or I forgot that you were born on um, on an actual military base mm -hmm. in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Wow, so your dad, your dad was active for how long? Uh, I believe he did, you know, the full term. We, uh, My parents separated when I was younger, so me and my dad kind of drifted apart. Mm. And you guys still don't talk now? No. At all? It's been, it's been that long? That's his loss. I feel you on that. Do you feel like, and I'm not trying to rekindle shit, I'm not that guy, but did you make an attempt thinking maybe, you know what, the guy doesn't know how to reach out to me, he hasn't dropped his nuts, let me make a solid attempt? Well, okay, so it was it was really troublesome with between me and my parents. I, I guess I thought I had this, you know, I can do anything attitude, and I actually ended up getting emancipated at 15. So, I, you know, that's the that fully divorcing from your parents, and then you move out, and you're like, Okay. What, is that the age, sorry to cut you off, is that the age federally or was that because of where you were at? Can anybody can anybody do that at 15? I never knew that. Okay, so continue. Uh, and I didn't either. One of my friends actually brought it up, and I had been getting into some trouble. I, <clears throat> I grew up mainly in New Orleans, so I was getting in a lot of trouble out there, and somebody was like, well, you know, you can always emancipate your parents, and, like, some light bulb went on in the corner of my head, and I thought it was a great idea. I thought I was big and fat, and, you know, I ended up going through with it, and then I was out on my own and it's like so where do you go now and at that time I was boxing at a youth camp um at a youth group like right next to the the Christian church that I went to still and, still in New Orleans yeah still in New Orleans okay. and um so I didn't have anywhere to go so I went to training that day and I box and like me and some girl ended up getting into like a actual fist fight from what we were supposed to be just you know calm sparring and he kind of pulled me to the side he's like what are you going through and I'm like you know, I moved out of my house. I don't have anywhere to go. So I basically lived in the gym for about a month or two. And then it got to the point where it was like my hot-headed problems. I ended up getting kicked out of the gym. And Jesus, woman. I, listen, it's been, a, it's been a long road. So I slept outside the gym, and I was kind of homeless for a couple more months after that. And then I ended up getting into some more trouble. Oh, I never saw that coming. So, oh my God. <laughs> we're, we're two minutes into the podcast and you almost got arrested and kicked out and everything. Oh, I did. I did get arrested. <laughs> you know. Uh, and then it got to the point where I had some family in Orlando and they were like, look, just, just move out here. You know, this living by yourself thing isn't working, so just move back home. And I was like, okay. So I moved back to Florida and got into some more trouble. But that was, I guess... How I got out here to Florida. Kendra, elaborate a little bit. You don't have to say the details of the trouble, but what was it that was gravitating you towards this type of trouble? Is it hot-headed, you know, feisty, you wanted to fight all the time? Or were you fucking around with robbing shit and stealing shit? I mean, a little, well, little bit of everything? I think it was a little bit of everything. I think I was just <clears> trying <throat> to find my place and find, you know, my adulthood in all the wrong areas and you know, I didn't, I've never really been the type to go look for it. It kind of just finds me and I'm like, hey, all right, let's hang out, you know. Sounds fun, sure. Sure, whatever. <laughs> like, the one time I got majorly arrested, I was I was legit just with my friend. I walked in to get her from the store and she had a huge bag. And I'm like, why didn't bitch, how you buy all that shit? Right. And she's like, just go, go, go. And I'm like, all right. So I went and, like, it got to the point where we all got arrested and I was that, you know, I'm going to wear it on my chest and, you know, I'm not going to say anything because that's my friend and, I'm going to find out my friend gets bonded out the very next day and leaves me in jail. <laughs> so it was, it took a long road of trying to be independent and even more independent, like realizing not everybody's your friend. And then, so I built up this very hard, not <coughs> trusting exterior that, you know, didn't really save me later on either. It kind of blinded me. It kind of gave me like an ignorance to things like, and that's what got me in trouble on later on down the years also. So when did this all start slowing down a little bit? I mean, since I've known you, you haven't got arrested. <laughs> so when is, you're still in Orlando at a what age now? You're about 19 or so? Yeah, I'm about, well, no, that was, I moved to Orlando. Earlier. Yeah, much earlier when mm -hmm. I was like 16, 17, you know, I got into more trouble drinking, you know, the party drugs that everybody gets into. And it just kind of carried on all the way until I was like 17, 18. And that's about the time that I started working in nightclubs. And then just the consistent access to alcohol just, you know, made things. That was where I think I took a big spiral down because it was like the drugs were plentiful, you know, the alcohol was plentiful, the very wrong crowds were plentiful. And then the people that you think, again, that are your friends, they're not your friends. And it 
got me into really bad situations. You know, coincidentally, just just last night, I, I, I did a podcast with Casey Chops. Shout out to Casey Chops. Um, you know, he's a DJ. He's been a DJ for a long time, and he, he worked for Power 96 as well, but he also works the clubs. And we were going back and forth on nightlife, you know, and I told him that I don't care who you are, that is a deteriorating-ass life. And it's very difficult to say no to once you get that feeling because the fast money, you know, the the – depending on your position, the groupies, the groupie love, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just hard to say no to that. It really is, you know, but it, it's a deteriorating life. And, oh. and and depending on where your mind's at, it can take it, you down deep, deep holes. I remember the first time that I had somebody spike my drink, one of the waitresses came to the back and put Coke up my nose. It was the first time I'd ever done Coke. <laughs> Shut the like, fuck up. Like, she put Coke up my nose, and I was like, okay, you know, I'm so she knew So she knew your drink got spiked. Well, I mean, yeah, I had only had a couple shots. At that point, I was I was a pretty, you know, big alcoholic. I was into ecstasy. That was the thing back in the day when we were younger, you know, like right. everybody's popping rolls and smoking and drinking. So I was doing all those things, but I hadn't really, you know, dove into that world yet. But I was an alcoholic. I could hold my own. Like, I could hold my own, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple drinks into the night, Nobody expects me to be throwing up and, you know, eyes rolling in the back of my head. And it was, it was a pretty bad experience, you know, which is another reason why I'm such a big advocate on women watching themselves when they go out. Because, you know, having your drink spiked is not a great feeling. It's definitely not something you're ever going to forget. And she's, so I'm in the back on the floor and she comes and she puts, you know, coke up my nose to wake me up. And it was like, I may not have gone through that if I wasn't working in a nightclub, you know what right, I mean? Because I wouldn't have been right. exposed to cocaine. People don't just go come in the back to see your eyes roll in yeah. the back of your head and put coke up your nose, and then they call an ambulance. Yeah. So that nightclub life, like when people tell me all the time, oh, I'm just going to go bartend for some extra <clears> money. I'm like, there's not an event company you can't go work for. <laughs> like, go work for a catering company. Go work for an actual sit-down restaurant. Like, I just don't, I never advocate for anybody to go bartend. And that whole bartending life was only in Orlando? Um, or is that you brought that down here as well? Well, I bartend now, but I only do events. Like, I'll do the, <coughs> the tennis open. I'll do things like NASCAR. I'll do these events that come. They bring the money, and then, you know, you part your ways. And, I mean, I'm three years drinking now, so it's a lot easier for me to handle both of the things, working around alcohol and not drinking. Plus, obviously, you're older now. you got a certain level of maturity, even if you're still young-minded to a certain extent. You are older, so you're making more mature decisions when it comes to the drinking. Uh, that sounds like an alcoholic thing to say, but you, you, you get what I'm saying. You know? It is, though, but that's why I chose to stop drinking because so many, I've encountered so many bad experiences from it. I've lost loved ones from drinking and driving. I've <clears throat> made huge mistakes from it. So it got to a point one year where I was like, that's that's it. You know, like, I can't, I can't keep doing this to myself. And this was my second time. Like, I had quit before, made it to two and a half years, and then everybody talked to me into social drinking. And I was like, oh, I can handle social drinking. But, like, I didn't understand the concept. I couldn't drink what I drank before and being a social drinker because then those, like, those moments were, like, really bad, you know? Mm -hmm. It was, like, five, six shots of Hennessy and you're a lightweight and it's, like, all the bad things because I have a temper problem. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm an angry drunk, so it's, it's, it comes out when I drink. And then those moments were bad, so I was just like, it's not a good thing at all. I need to just stop. You seem like a very... I know you are, let's just say that. I'm, I'm saying it for the for the people listening, but <clears throat> I know you're very grounded now. I know that you, you your mind is a completely different place. Like once again, you're older as well. 32, you said? 33. Three, 33. Um, do you do you know, you think, or do you know where this anger stems from? It doesn't, alcohol doesn't just bring anger. There's no, hey, vodka does anger and fucking whiskey does horniness. No, it's all alcohol, motherfucker. Whatever comes out, comes out, and your mind's going to play a role. But do you know where that stems from, that little anger issue? Uh, I think it's just the progressive keeping things down. I went to therapy for a long time, which I'm a big advocate of therapy, in whatever form you find it, you know. But I think it's from suppressing, suppressing, suppressing. I always felt like when I drank, you you know, you don't, for, you don't remember what your issues are. You don't think about what hurts you. So... I always felt like, okay, well, you know, the closer to the bottom I get, the closer to the bottom of the bottle I get, the closer to happiness I'll get. And it was just something that you had to break, that, that alcohol doesn't cure. It covers, it bandages, <clears throat> and at some point you're going to explode. And have you addressed that? Have you gone deeper into that rabbit hole of addressing the things that you've gone through? I mean, obviously you told me earlier that, you know, you, you are now recently you've been sober for how long? Three years. Three years. Yeah, that's really good. 
That's really good. That's that's tough. That's hard. <clears throat> I think that. Oh God, give me a drink. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but no. Congrats on that. Okay, that that that's big. Um, you had mentioned earlier that you've lost loved ones. I've definitely I've been on the horrible side of of taking a life because of alcohol, and that's something that I paid the price for. You know my story, and and it's a horrible thing, and and. I definitely don't do any of that now. I don't condone it. And it's a great thing that we have Uber now. And uh, still, you know, to hear you say these things that you that you obviously have done some research on. And I don't know if you have, have you seen the psych or anything like that in the past or no? A psychiatrist, Ther- yes. yes, therapists and mm-hmm. stuff like that. They help they help people realize these type of things. You know, the, like you said, the bandage. Just you know, it's a bandage and things of that nature. So, um, and by the way, something else that's considered a bandage is tattoos. Now, not everybody, but that is a theory behind it. And if no one's seen this on YouTube or any video platform, they can't see that you are jacked up <laughs> literally to the tetas yeah. with tattoos. First of all, what minus your face doesn't have tattoos on it? Uh, I have the, the painful spots left. Like I have a quarter of the inside of my thigh. Um, and on the other side, it's like half of my inner thigh, <clears throat> one foot and one hand. And, uh, like, this tiny spot on my collarbone. So, I mean, and my face. Like, everything else is pretty You're much. You're not going to the face right I can't promise I'm not. Can't but judge, I can't. And what's funny is, like, Save at every that for stage. The lives. Yeah, every, every stage, everybody's been like, don't do it, don't do it. And I'm like, it's just going to happen if it happens, you know. I mean, all of my tattoos, thank God, have been from very great artists. They're very tasteful. And, you know, they've, they've even my mother. My mother hates uh, uh tattoos and the whole genre and everything that goes with it and she's still like every time i get one that's nice that's nice because i i know in her way she actually likes it but she doesn't want to you know when when you get them are you are you storytelling in some shape or form are you symbolizing in some shape or form or is it a mixed breed and, a, and there's also a lot of that looks dope and i just want that on me I think all of them are a form of that mixture. Like some of them have been very deeply uh, meaningful. Like this one is of my fiance that passed away. And then some of them, uh, actually this one is from a friend that I lost at the Pulse uh, shooting back in 2016. So all of them mean something to me, but they just might have like a different meaning. Like uh, I have a Kuropi tattoo. What the fuck is that? (laughs) It's Hello uh, Hello Kitty's little frog friend. Isn't that a Puerto Rico's? It's it's like that, but it's just like it's just the frog face, and he's got like little heart eyes. It's just it's a silly little tattoo, but like I was going through some really tough emotional stuff, and it was just (coughs) something that it it made me smile. It was cute, so at that moment, it was very therapeutic and meaningful to me. It didn't have much deeper meaning besides it was cute. But you know, everybody's tattoos mean something different. Yeah, some of them may pick it off the wall, but there's still something psychologically that drew them to that so i think every tattoo has a meaning you know um <clears throat> i want to get back to when you mentioned that you had lost your your fiance i remember when we met you know that happened recently we'll get back to that though but out of all these tattoos top three most painful um my collarbone that one we had done most painful or the most weird because your bone is shaking no that shit hurt. it hurt it okay hurt. okay we had been about seven or eight hours in already though <clears throat> and uh he was like okay well we're gonna have to fix this little spot and i, well, I don't know what side's on but he's like right. we're gonna have to fill in this little spot and because it looks empty like the other side and i was like that's my collarbone <laughs> you want to do that after we've been working all day and he's yeah. like we got to and that one i think i was just this close into tears for that <sighs> one was pretty bad um, I have one that goes like on the inner part of my thigh, like where your groin is, like mm-hmm. right there where the two areas meet, and it's just a it's just a different part of skin. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's softer so because it's always wrinkling and stretching. It and it's feels different... like it burns into <clears throat> your skin almost. So it's a it's a really uncomfortable feeling. And then um... you telling me the nipples. Because what people don't know is you literally got it all the way up. You got... Wh- it's all, all the way around. They're mandalas. I was going to say they're like sons, but no, they're not sons. No. <laughs> they're mandalas, and they go around. So they what's, manda- like what's a mandala? Mandalas are... It's um like the thing that you draw in that's like a therapy. It's supposed to make you feel better. It's like a... It's got some deeper meaning to it. Um, It ties in like, well, I have a lotus flower right here. Oh, I know. Now I know the style. Okay, I know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. So, and that one didn't hurt like that? It's not in the top three, top, no? Wow. I, I mean, a lot of people. down here <clears throat> in between. Because your chest cavity. Yeah, yeah, I think this hurt probably more. Those are top three. 
That's 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 some shit right there. I'll tell you what. Um, there's still a lot of tattoos that I want to get. My back will definitely be a full full on you know mural type whatever symbolization of my family. That shit's gonna wait because that shit hurts so bad. I got enough things on my back, and every fucking piece of my back hurts like hurts. And I don't know everybody's. It's not about pain tolerance. I got a great pain tolerance. I think everybody's body has a more sensitive area somewhere. Yeah. Like when I get under my arms, <clears throat> the inside of my biceps, apparently everybody hates that, especially guys. That shit doesn't bug me. That's like a little tiny pinch. It does not bug me. But when you're on my tricep, right there with a the tricep, I got a good strong tricep. Maybe it's because my tricep is hard and the harder of spot is, the more the nerves get smashed. I don't know, but my back was so I, painful. I did my back. We did two hours of first day. Uh, I gave a tattoo baby. So she, she drew in She's my boys. She's a beast. Yeah, she drew in my boys. She did a lot of my tattoos. And I, we did the tattoos pre-show. Shout so out to Tattoo cool. Baby. She's yes. very, very, very yeah. known in the tattoo community. She's known in the world. She's got a huge following. Sexy little thing. <laughs> so they they just put out her show again actually ink master on netflix so that's popping up again and i'm that's like so i had her before then so like we did two hours and then the next day we did 10 hours and like I, it was easy for me like i fell asleep through it it wasn't painful i have my boys they sit in between two angel on uh, two angel wings and she wrote and she freehanded all of it so like I was very lucky to get her pre-show because i'm, I'm pretty sure the prices after show <laughs> for what i got would have been oh like, man i'll tell you what in, in Tattoo Baby's defense, she's the real deal. She's super known. She does amazing work. But goddamn, have I heard that her prices right now are pretty insane. And hey, more power to you. You know your worth. Mm -hmm. I, I hear she's got like a fucking six-month waiting list or three-month waiting yeah, list. You know, long. Yeah, I mean, when you know you're that demanded and you barely got time and you know what it takes, you know what you're worth, yeah, fucking charge what you're going to charge. Yeah, I got I'm a really good team. artist, though. Uh, when she would go away, I would go see another artist. His name's Jason Aaron. He does really, really good work. He's the one that did all these little fine lines on me, which he really hates me for. But they came out, you know, really nice, and I like the way it been, it's been. He's the one that did all my chest piece. So we've been rocking out since then. So, you know, I've got a good alternative. I'm dying to go back and see Cat, but that wait list is rough. <laughs> it's rough. She'd be calling me, too, like, you want to get a tattoo? Like, today, like... Who's got tattoo money just sitting around? Like, hold on, like six hundred dollars is coming. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do right? it. <laughs> Call it. I got the money. <laughs> six. What's up, right? folks? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Black Sheep Perspective, Season Two. If this happens to be your first time watching or listening, please take a quick second to hit that subscribe button and tap that notification bell so that you don't miss another episode. Once again, thank you, everyone out there, for all the support. Anyhow, so, but going back to what you had mentioned in regards to, uh, you know, your your fiance, you know, this this happened um, four years ago, if I'm not mistaken, we spoke about that, and I remember when I saw you again, so to give you guys a, a further detailed backdrop on, on Kendra and I, we, we had already been friends, I actually helped coach her a few times through a mutual friend of ours who used to cross train with her, so we cross trained all together, and, you know, I led the team and whatever, and we grew a bond, and if she wasn't living further we would have been training a whole lot more. That, that's for sure. I definitely wanted to chain Kendra. She was trying to fight. I know you did have a few fights. Um, so anyhow, fast forward, I hadn't seen you for a while. We all meet at UFC gym. Me and you like, what's up? You know, we're flipping out. We love that, you know, we're there. And um, you just went through, you know, a, a tragic loss. And I remember finding out about it because of your kids. Because, you know, that was the tough part for them because he actually grew on to them as well. If you don't mind, tell me a little bit about what was that that, that happened. Um, my fiance was probably like, like I want to say like a fairy tale kind of love. Like it was, I'd been through some really hard things, been through a really hard life, a lot of trust issues, and especially with guys. And it was just, you know, he was very understanding. We had went through a lot of loss of mutual friends that year, and it was it was really rough on everybody. So when when we connected, it was on a very emotional basis, and he just poured into me emotionally, you know, like spoiled me 100%, never neglected any of my feelings, was always there for me. So it was just one of those pinch me relationships. Like uh, it, was, it, it was corny. It was the corniest thing. We were the couple that scribbled the names and it was, it was heaven, you know? Oh, yeah. that's dope. And I was never that person. So for me, everybody <laughs> was like, who are you right now? Like you must really mm. be in love. And then uh, he was drinking and was driving home and it just I like I really remember 
all of that in pretty good detail, getting all these text messages after I, I've just finished teaching a class and it was a lot of text messages and it was probably the hardest thing I think I've ever been through in my life. Sounds like it. Yeah, it, it really was, does. It was harder than anything else I'd ever been through. And with just losing so many people <coughs> the previous years, it was like he was literally holding me up. And then when I lost him, it was like I was lost. Like emotionally, we had planned this long future together, so I had to rewrite my life again. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I remember catching, walking into your life, you know, after that, and you were in a weird transitional phase. Obviously, the difficulty was there. We know that. There's no that. And, and I don't ever want to act like I know what that is. We've all lost somebody, and depending on your connection, will we'll determine a whole lot of, you know, how much you can uh, empathize with somebody or sympathize with somebody. I've never lost a loved one like that who I was with and who I felt such amazing, you know, lovey-dove things that, yeah, it sounds, it sounds whack as fuck and corny, this and that, but it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. And anybody out there listening or, or watching felt you the minute, oh, I, everybody said, oh, because it's awesome when you, when you do got that, you know? But um, I know that you were getting ready to try to move and you just didn't know where or, or why yet. And then at the UFC gym, we were all doing pretty good. We are all kicking ass. We all started making some really good money. And I think you decided to move down south to South Florida. At the time, you were where? Right before you moved to with Homestead? My, yeah, with my fiance in Hollywood, we had a house out there. Okay, so you were already in Hollywood with him. So you eventually you came down. <clears throat> you were there for a minute. Again, we're doing our thing. Not to blast on the old boss. Whatever. <laughs> but, you know, we had a boss. We had a system. We had a corporation that did not... Whatever it is, it trickled down to the soldiers, and it made a lot of people feel always uneasy at work, always a pressured situation. You're not doing enough. You need to do more. And it was draining. It was draining because we're already dealing with people's energies. We're all coaches, personal trainers and coaches. If you coach mixed martial arts, you're an even badder asser trainer because you're taking impact. You're showing details to, you know, how to rotate, how to kick, how to punch, whatever it is. And yet, as a coach of any sort, you're always taking on people's energies. And you're playing psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist, life coach, coach, life coach, everything, all while trying to get results out of them and keep them motivated and doing your job right. It's very draining. This is why people out there, you get what you pay for. And we do deserve what we ask when we, when we ask on that upper end. But needless to say, eventually you felt a little bit too much pressure from homeboy, the boss, and and uh, work, and, and you decided to, to, to leave. And I remember you surprised us all because we were pretty tight. And me and you always kicked it, and we always did our thing and hung out and did lunch and all that other bullshit, trained a few times. Um, I never got to punch you, though. <laughs> it's not, still a chance. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but, and then you left. Tell us what was that about and what, what, trans- what, what, what transpired next after that. It, w- it was really emotional leaving UFC because, I mean, they created that bond, like, right away with us when we all did our Hell Week. Our course, yeah. Yeah, and it was, I had fallen, it was like, my fiancé passed away. The next month, I was, you know, faced with a couple of options, and, you know, I met, sat down with Yannick, and, you know, I was like, okay, well, I feel this in this interview, and I actually cried in the interview because he was asking me about, you know, life, your personal life, and, I like, I see it now, retrospect, that he was asking about our personal lives so he could su- consume our lives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I told him, you know, I just... Can I like, take this one soul? <laughs> 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 Fucking asshole. He was like, if so, you know, I, we had that bond, and I was like, okay, well, I'll work here, and it was a bunch of you guys that, you know, we had through martial arts, had all worked together, we all yep, knew each yep. other, we had all trained together. Um, David so Gomez. It was, yeah, it was, <clears throat> it was real comfortable for me to just roll right in there, and then we went through... Hell week and hell week was rough. Like I had uh, the week after the interview with Yannick, I had fallen off my motorcycle on the turnpike. Oh, I remember you were super. You got pictures yeah, of that. Yeah, I got road rash Big everywhere. Time. I was yeah. going like seventy on the turnpike, and some lady just stopped. Like I saw the car in front of her stop, so I started to slow down. And it was one of those she noticed late, so she hit her brakes. I locked up. The bike went under, and then I rolled to the left. And <sighs> yeah, so I had road rash everywhere. The ambulance took me to the hospital. They kept me there for two days. And I called Yannick, and I'm like, "Hey, you know, I just got into a bike accident." And he's like, "Well, I wonder how you're gonna make it through Hell Week." <laughs> and that, I was like, and that's when you realized. Oh, oh. 
This is what I'm signing up for. Oh, okay. Cool. No doubt. But I did. I made it. I got out of the hospital and, you know, I went to the burn victim, uh, burn unit. They gave me the creams, the wraps, and then you saw me oh, through Hell Week. Sure. I had I all the wraps, yep. everything. You know, I muscled through it and I we, we did Hell Week. So we all had this insane bond. But it was like, it was it was insane. Like, we would get to work at 7 in the morning. We wouldn't leave till 10, 11 at night. Like, Everybody knew my kids because they were always there. Like my, I would drop off the kids yes. to school in the morning. I yes. would pick them up right after school. They would eat, you know, after school snack. They would eat dinner. They would do homework, everything. And it just got to the point where I hadn't unpacked any of my fiance's boxes. You know, I hadn't decided what I exactly wanted to do in my life because I was an independent strength and conditioning coach before right. UFC. I was right. working for the individual dojos. And so that was, it's such a different world when you work for yourself <laughs> in a dojo versus when you work in a commercial gym. The quotas, the pressures, the, oh the, the, the everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had, how many classes did I teach? I taught four yeah. classes a day. Oh, you had a huge following. You had a huge following. I had like 20 clients. I worked seven, six, seven days a week. You were like, a mean bitch too. Oh, man. I had oh, like, man, you guys have no idea. She was a mean, but they loved her. They loved her meanness. They're like, oh, my God. Bro, girls, women will get out of your kickboxing class. <laughs> She's such a bitch, but I love her. <laughs> no, for real. No, no. I don't. I would never hang out with her. But, man, did she push that class really good. <laughs> I had, like, a, a pass-out rate in UFC. Yeah, I was man. like, no. And, I, you know, I loved it. I loved what I did, but it wasn't exactly how I wanted to do it. So right, it got right, to a right, point right. where now your your reasons why aren't there, and I'm not, you know, it takes harder to push. And then when you start to evaluate yourself you start to see what you've been burying and that was when like it was I had moved but all his boxes were just sitting everywhere and I went to Yannick and I was like look you know I, I just need a break like I can't take it it was like every month I was doing great and then every month the bar went higher and higher and I mm -hmm. felt like I was in a rat race and like I said if you don't have your reasons why tied into your daily motivation you won't ever last and I was like I can't do this a single mom with two kids I can't do this so I left Unfortunately, and I'm not trying to beat up Yannick. He's a young guy. He's still learning. I'm sure he's a way better boss now. He's older now. His birthday just passed. See, Yannick, happy birthday in case you watch this shit, you see? But at that time, he definitely wasn't helpful to help alleviate a little bit of what you were going through, help him make it a little bit easier for you. He, he, he wasn't good at that. He felt, like, he, he felt like he'd been through enough and everybody needs to go through it. And if you can't hack it, then you got to go. And that's not how you build somebody up when they're, when they're down or when they're about to fall. You know, you don't do that. And, you know, I think it was also the corporate behind it. When it turned to A-Rod's gym, things, the yes, atmosphere just kind of changed well. a little bit. You know what I mean? Because, like, they've all been really, really good to me. And we just had different views. Like, I don't believe you should cycle through your employees so much. I think you should nurture the ones you got. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was the only I was the only martial arts female, female yeah. the only female yep, martial arts that. instructor there. Yep. Like, they should have you know <clears throat> given a little bit more understanding. They should have kept the bar where it was at. I mean, I mean, it, to to be success, successful in, in that kind of industry, I think you need to be single. And then, like you were saying, it's so hard to date in when you're in a building for 10, 11, 12 hours every single day. It was like, unless you were dating somebody there or, you know, yep. unless you had your kids with you there every day, you didn't see family and you didn't have a world besides that. These, these are all facts. These and are all 100% accurate. It was, I was having a mental breakdown. And then the fact that there was 30, 40 coaches that were almost encouraged to, you know, kind of take from each other instead of work together. It was like, we all loved each other because we had a bond, but then, we got to hit quotas, and then you, the dirt dog came out of a bunch of people, and we do remember when those shits happened. Yes, and we I, do. I just, I don't have that in me. Like, yeah. I, I go from zero to a thousand with it. It's mm -hmm. like, and, and it, it was would be way past professional, and it's just, I saw all those things coming. Don't bring that New Orleans out of me. Oh, don't bring Lord. that 16-year-old New Orleans go girl ahead, out of me. Go ahead, try to steal my class. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, I just, I had to back away from the situation to get my mind together. So once you did, you told me that earlier, that eventually you, you went to a, a different gym. Eventually, first you took a couple months off, got you know, got whatever, gathered yourself together. You went to another gym, you're doing your thing there, less pressure, having fun there. And soon later after that, something else happened. You decided to do something different. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, I'm a hustler, so by any means, I'm gonna make it work. You know, between these specific gigs and these specific gigs, and somebody needs this or that, and still having my small personal training clients, you know, I made ends go and, you know, things were kind of good coasting along and I'm like, okay, so what's the next step? And, uh, I was actually home folding my clothes and 
I'm like, I, you know, I'm an advocate for sex trafficking, but I was more on the low key end. Right. It was more like I just went to places like Agape. I would volunteer. I would, you know, staple. I would do these things, just random things, nothing very <clears throat> meaningful, but meaningful for me. Exactly. I felt like I was right. helping. Uh, and then I'm watching a Netflix documentary and you're, you're always drawn to these things, you know, when you feel real life situations on TV that you've been yeah, when you connect to, when yeah, you yeah. connect to it in some shape or form, it does something different to you in regards to how it brings you in. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching this documentary and at the beginning they mentioned my attack, my, my, um, my attacker's name and it was something that I'd never shared with anybody. I'd never really told anybody, you know, the things that I had been through. It was, you know, 15, 16 years ago, and it was just something that the therapy that I went through, although f helpful to help me get through the years, it taught me how to bury things. So mm. it was, I was able to function. And that's technically person. not what therapy is supposed to do, right? I think that you should find a therapist that's right for you. Like, I'm a Okay, so some, some that would benefit. Hey, yeah. don't let it come out like this. But others, Or somebody probably... that understands. Like, there's, there's specific therapists for like trauma induced therapists that each one right. of them has their okay. experience in dealing with these kind of victims. But I didn't find actual good therapy until after this happened in an actual situational, uh, situational training. So I relived some of the things that I went through in my life and I had a complete breakdown. But before that, what allowed me to even open the door to going to that was this documentary, this documentary brought up things and people and situations I hadn't thought about in years. And it was just like a, a big PTS breakdown <clears throat> and me realizing that it was, it was time for me to go to the forefront of this advocacy and really pull sex trafficking out into, because everybody's, you know, this hashtag me too, you know, Jeffrey right. Epstein, like this is start to become a trending issue. And everyone's saying it too. Oh, all these girls are coming out now. Gosh, you know, well, these girls are coming out because they feel safe now. Of course. You know, because back when I went through this, it was 10, 15 years. I mean, it was 15 years ago. It was, you don't talk about those things. None of these things were discussed. Like if something happened to you, it was very shameful on your part and you shouldn't speak about it. So for me to be seeing this real life documentary with, my life on it that I've been running from for so long, it was just, it was very mentally shaking. Like it was. <clears throat> when I, when, when you first got here, we were catching up for a little bit before we started the podcast. And, um, I was just basically telling you, say, Hey, you know, I, my podcasts are all organic. So whatever you say here is a good chance. You're going to have to repeat it, but this is just me being a friend. You know, I want to catch up with you before we get on the podcast just to make sure, you know, I don't say or go too deep into any one thing. And we talked about the, your sons and this and that and everything else, touch bases on past things. And I said, Kendra, what, what was it that got you into this tra sex trafficking thing? Because I, I thought I saw you mention something about being a victim. And, hey, it doesn't matter how good you know each other. I don't remember you ever mentioning anything like that. And it's not like you were supposed to, but I never caught drift of that. And I asked you to tell me, you know, I said, what happened? What is this? You know, if you don't mind talking, and you did. You mind telling us what exactly is it that happened? You don't have to you know, express the details, details, but what is it that happened where you experienced this, this sex trafficking ordeal that occurred with you? It was uh, when I was 18, 19, and I was working in the nightclubs. Like, like I said, I had built up this exterior wall where it was like I didn't trust anybody and everybody was suspect. So one night while I'm working, this guy approaches me about making money and this and that. And I'm like, shoot, be gone. You know, I know your type, you know. But I was so loud and I was drinking so much that I think it made me oblivious to the little things, you know, like to who's coming and going and who <coughs> are they coming and going with. Like, I didn't have any sense of situational awareness. I had okay. non-swivel. It was fully direction towards fun and liquor and you know, living my best life and can't nobody beat me. And the louder I was, the more ignorant I was. I missed things, you know. And then um, I I met these two girls. I had never been to Miami. I was living in Orlando. And these two girls are like, hey, let's go to Miami to celebrate New Year's. And I'm like, all right, you know, seems harmless enough. So I get in my car and I go and I hang out with these girls. And one or two drinks later, I'm feeling funny. And, you know, I had told you I was a drinker then. So one or two drinks is nothing for me. And, I, the like, before the ball even dropped, I blacked out. Like, I only had two hours worth of what my night was hanging right, out right, with them. Right. And then when I woke up the next day, I woke up in a moving van. And the van was moving. And it was daytime. And I was so confused. And I rolled over. And I was laying between the 
driver's side and the passenger side in the minivan. You know how there's that big space there? Yes. And I roll over, and this guy grabs his gun right off of the top, and he pulls it down, and he's like, are we going to have any problems? And it's like your mind kind of breaks a little bit subconsciously, and you you kind of try and decide fight or flight, like, how do I get myself out of this situation? How did I get myself into this situation? Who are you? What's going on? And these two girls actually worked for him. So when he realized it wasn't going to work by him coming in trying to get me, he sent two girls in to come, hang out, have drinks in the club, serve mm-hmm. them. They tip me good, you know, things like that. And then <coughs> these be the girls that are actually plotting with him. You know, like if I would have paid more attention, I probably could have seen them with him. I could probably could have right. seen oh, him I picking them up. Yeah. It's just that was like everyone thinks, oh, it won't happen to me. It can't happen to me. But I mean, they if they feel like their entryway into you is not going to work, that doesn't mean they won't try something else. So, did you have to fucking kick a door down and all ass, or what do you mean to get out? Yeah. So I actually stayed in that situation for about three or four months, and it was it was pretty rough trying to kind of go with the swing of things, kind of do as you're told. They definitely use a lot of um, persuasive methods to mm-hmm. try to keep you there. I didn't have my driver's license. Um, I was always in under his supervision. And fast forward a couple months later, it was like I had gained his trust, and he decided to you know take off for a little bit, and then I saw my opportunity to leave. So, And it wasn't that any other time that I could leave because – we ended up in a house where the, the, the windows and the doors, the back door, were nailed shut. So there's no leaving. You don't have door handles. You have just a key, and you don't have that key. You come out for your purpose. You go back in for your purpose. And then it was he left us with one of the girls, and she didn't lock our bedroom doors. So I had been working, you know, trying to stash and, you know, st- like hide some money and try to get myself together and talk to somebody to help me and – I, you know, I, I left and I ran to a gas station. I called somebody for some help. Then I kind of bunkered down for three or four days, and he was able to help get me all the way over to Florida. God damn. That's tough. That's tough. Um, appreciate you sharing that with us, you know. that's uh, I've never known anybody go through anything like that, and I've seen a lot of documentaries, and every time I see them, I cringe. I can't fucking believe it. I'm in mean, just utter shock that it's happening and happening the way it does, and <clears throat> I told you earlier, you know, that shit sick my stomach. I said, when you mentioned it, I immediately told you, bro, something weird just happened in my heart. That's exactly what I told you, because I don't know how to explain it. My heart didn't drop. But something in my heart just did something weird, because I just despise it, despise the thought of it. I can't believe it's done the way it's done and to the extent that it is right now. So the fact that you're now trying to, you know, uh, uh, use that, because a Netflix special got your attention and lit some different type of fire under your ass, and now, man, what else can I do? I feel like this is something I got to do, and you started running with it, and bring us to that point. You you, you tried to start the uh, nonprofit organization, but I think COVID kind of held you back, right? Well, after I saw the documentary, it was uh, like a like an addiction. Now I had to know what he's been doing, you know, these past years you know, where he's been at, and he had actually, he, he was actually in prison, I found him in prison, for taking a girl from PT's. Oh, BT's the strip club? PT's. PT's. Yes, the strip club. Oh, but it's called PT's. Isn't it called PT's? Right no, there. BT's. No, in Hialeah. It's right there in Hialeah. PT's. I think, whatever, who cares, strip what? club. A okay. strip club. But a club, like, right close to where I live, in the area that I've been in. So this man's been moving around in my mm-hmm. area for all these years. And it was just like, I lost total sense of security. Like I started to get more into uh, tactical tactics and then, you know, arming myself, protecting myself, getting training. And I went to a place called tactical Disneyland, which was, it's the best place. It literally is the best place. So he kind of stage walked me through situational awareness and uh, training and then it was like a first we did, you know, little things going to and from the car. And then he kind of stepped it up to the shoot house. And then I did a situation where it was rescuing a sex trafficked victim. And I went in there and it was kind of similar to some things I had been through. And when I was in there and, and it was just like a trigger word, the guy said something uh, and I kicked the guy over and popped him one time in the head. And it was just like a, 
hyperventilating. I couldn't breathe. We were doing UTM rounds. Mm. And it was like I couldn't breathe. And I had a breakdown. And it was like I felt a personal obligation that you made it out. You did good. You've been proving yourself to be a different person for these last 10 years. You know, everybody's known me to be this person who's always trying to succeed. Mm. Why can't I show these other girls this that it's possible to have a life after what they've been through. Why can't I be the one to go help one of these girls? Because no one came to help me. I had missing persons report filed on me from my family, and they ended up, so he had my cell phone, he had my, my driver's license, he had all my info, and the cops are blowing up my cell phone, and he pulls me out to the car, and he's like, you need to fix this situation. So while I'm sitting with a gun to my head, I'm <coughs> having to tell the cops, no, I'm fine, don't come get me. And then that's it. The line hangs up. Like, that's it. No, you know, after yeah, that point, yeah. nobody's coming for you. Right. And right. it just, it, it's like, I was lost in my world trying to figure out what do I do next? Where do I go next? What do I do with all these emotions? And it's like, I went to SHOT Show in Vegas in January. and uh, SHOT went, Show, is that, is that a gun it's, conference? It's or something? a gun conference. Okay. It's one of the biggest ones it's in <clears throat> Vegas every okay. year. And um, we're all introducing ourselves from our profession and, you know, what it is that we're going to be networking as and I'm, I'm telling these people because I had moved into security full-time security and I'm telling these people yeah I'm security I'm security and it just it didn't feel right it didn't sit right with me like this idea that I had in my head that I should be the one to go help these people just was not going to go away so I said no I'm here for anti-sex trafficking and everybody all of a sudden was like if you need help call me here's my card here's my card here's my card so I uh reached out to another documentary that was raising awareness in it and I said I want to do this and they're actually Jane Monks. The documentary is called Stopping Traffic, and they are amazing. They helped me literally heal my heart to be able to do this work that I'm going to be able to do. And I'm in their second documentary, which should be coming out next year, I believe. What's the name of it again? Stopping Traffic. Stopping Traffic. The next one will be Stopping <coughs> Traffic. Too. And it should be on Netflix or um, somewhere well, else? Well, they, they, they actually, it's independent because they approached Netflix with their first documentary. But because their first documentary started out with a man speaking about his experience, Netflix said no, that it was too shocking for them. Mm. And now I'm pretty sure that they would roll around to it, but yeah, Netflix yeah, yeah. is kind of shaky nowadays, so I'm not yeah, sure. You think? Well, with their reputation about you know how they were putting on that that video that movie called Cuties with the fuck man, they dropped the ball old, with that bullshit, and they're they're doing a lot of things like that. And I it's didn't just, know that. Okay, it's so a lot of people are kind of shifting their view back and forth on Netflix, but wherever the movie goes, it's it. the first one helped raise some major awareness, and the second one is going to show survivors in their story and how they were able to pull themselves back together after this. So I think <clears throat> that no matter whether it's a documentary, it's this podcast, it's you know the advocacy work I do, all of this is something that's in my responsibility to share this message so everybody wakes up to it, you know? So, and then you definitely, not just because of that gun show you went to, but everything that you're talking about, and you did tell me this earlier, this got you way more involved in tactical practices in regards to tactical, you know, arms and everything else that comes with tactical. I, I don't want to say flipping this and blowing up that, but yeah, everything you can fucking imagine, you know, and which, and soon enough, and I, I'm dying to hear this story, this is definitely a... a this is all becoming way more positive now, and that's awesome, you know, that, that we're getting to look at what you're doing now. You ended up being on a dope ass reality show that was brand new, made by I don't know the guy's name, but I know he's famous as hell. <laughs> he's been on Joe Rogan. He's really good friends with Ruben. Um, Ru I don't know, yeah, you, you yeah, know, yeah, know, Ruben, a good friend of ours, jujitsu badass, third degree black belt. Um, what's his real name? Tony Sema. Tony Se what? Sem Senema. Se Tony, <laughs> he's got tactical, real world real tactical. World tactical. Is yeah. the one that just came out on. Um, Call of Duty. And his Instagram is actually called Real World yes. Tactical. Um, and he just came out in Call of Duty. And he also has a um, program that you guys were involved in that I, wa I want to hear details of how I got there and what exactly was it that you guys went through. What's up, folks? Thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of The Black Sheep Perspective, Season 2, baby. If this happens to be your first time watching or listening, Please take a quick second to hit that subscribe button and tap that notification bell so that you don't miss another episode. And once again, guys, really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, everyone out there, for all the amazing support. And a big shout out to my man Hector and his entire team over there at Driver Shop USA. If you guys follow me on IG or live in this beautiful city of Miami, you'll be able to catch the dope-ass rap job that was done to my Chevy Colorado truck. 
Not only did they wrap the entire truck to protect its original paint job, they then slapped on multiple high quality logo wraps on all sides so that I can remind those of you who are looking to tune in to the best new podcast. From boats to motorcycles to automobiles of all kinds, Driver Shop USA is continuously redefining luxury. Now let's get back to the podcast. Okay, so bring us into that experience, the the, the real world tacticals. How did how did it all happen? Did you reach out? Did they reach out? Was it a mutual friend? How did that happen? And take us through it, because it looked fucking fun as hell. Oh, I I, I loved it. Um, I found, so he found, he reached out to me and sent me the submission page, because that was when the trailer for Stopping Traffic 2, that documentary that I'm going to be in, okay. it came out, so I had been sending it to a couple of people, so they saw it. He saw it and he was like, oh man, that would be really great. You know, he wanted to bring people on who had been through certain traumas or just needed a little bit of a push. So I'm watching the little three minute thing and it's like they're fighting, they're lifting and they're shooting. And I'm like, oh, those are all the three things. I, I do love. all three. Like, those are for free. I get to go train them for free. I'm great <laughs> there. Sign me up. Bruh. Yeah. <laughs> like I did not anticipate half of the stuff he was going to put us through. When and I saw his, his preview commercial thing his trailer which is dope and it shows all you guys the minute he said what he said i was like oh god kendra got murdered he was like basically the point of the show is i want to show people what i go through on a daily basis in order to be ready for it i was like i see everything this guy does he's a fucking (laughs) maniac oh my god kendra died (laughs) and like i had been so consumed since the pandemic with security work i hadn't been training like i was you know i hadn't been practicing sparring hitting pads nothing so like i went into it totally out of shape and i was like well i'm just gonna do you know i'm gonna i'm a muscle thrower this is what i do but it was called unbreakable minds for a reason like there was gonna be no sick big successful moment like in that situation this in every situation that he pushed us to our limit was for us to understand you know you got to be able to overcome the situation and overcome all the bad shit that's surrounding what you're going through and like uh i'm a big complainer you know this from when you tried to me. <laughs> you used to cuss me out. Oh, Mark. man. Shut up, Kendra. But like, <clears throat> I mean, I've always got the job done. Like, I'm always going to do it. But, like, complaining was, I guess, my coping. You know, like, I wasn't really a complainer. You know, I would just jokingly complain. So what kind of complaints were you doing to him? I was talking shit. <laughs> A whole fucking lot of it, man. I had a smart-ass comment for everything he said. So, like, he put up some of it on his story, too, and it's, like, like it's a showing me and him, and it's, like, bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> And I'm, like, fuck. So did you guys, did he give you crazy obstacle courses? And it, it was, like, I mean, he deprived <clears throat> us of sleep. He deprived mm. us of food. He deprived us of, you know, showering. Like, he... I like waterboarded us. He he put us through hell. It was he pepper sprayed us. That was probably the worst part of all of it. Like I wasn't. You've, into, you've never been pepper sprayed. No, before that. and like I was always like, oh, you know, in the security industry, you're, at some point you're gonna. Yeah, get exactly. Pepper I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah. But at least then you get something that says you did like a class or something. No, this was just you know oh, for my shit. emotional growth. You can't put that on a resume. I was on the house. I took it on the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. So, and I didn't even anticipate it. Like none of that was in the beginning show. Like I, he didn't say right. any of that was. But we had to sign some serious waivers. Mm. And I understand. In case you lose an eye, in case this, in case that. Yeah. Yeah, and then at the end, then we ended up sparring with two pro fighters, and that was, like, for me, taking off a year and a half and not being in physical yeah. shape. It was just it was a little yeah, we, we We were just um, talking about who the fighter was earlier, um, Zoila, Zoila Frausto, if I'm saying her last name right, because she's, bro, she looks Hispanic, but she's, I don't think she is. She actually looks like she might be Samoan of some sort. I don't know. She has a very uh, unique look to her. But, yeah, she's a badass, and she's a, a Muay Thai person more than anything. She trains out of CSA, I think. And then she also trains out of a now she's come, zone. Yeah, now yeah. she comes down south. She just started that, like, in the last year. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, so she can bounce back. So the minute we figured out who she was, I was like, oh, shit, Kendra, you sparred against her? Yeah, no wonder your nose is bleeding. By the way, you had to send me a – for those who don't know, Kendra was showing me a picture earlier – of her sparring session and blood was coming out the nose. <laughs> it was I mean, like I, it was a simple mistake too. Like I forgot to take my nose ring out, so my nose ring cut the inside, and that's where the little leak came from. Oh, that sounds painful. It, like it, I actually didn't notice it at all. Like it, it was. How long was the uh, the whole experience with the uh, the f- filming of the real tactical? Five days. Five days. Okay. But it was like <clears throat> he did not let us rest. Like the very oh, first course, day, man. he drug us through the complete mud, and then at night was like knocking on our doors at two in the morning to get us up to work out 
and for like three, four hours, we're out there in the middle of the night, and then it's back the next day. So every day was a morning and night. He literally abused us for those five days. When is um is that out already, or is he waiting for something? Or? It's out right now. It's out on Warrior Poet Society Network. Damn, he, Dan, he put that out, because I would have went and checked it out. I thought he only put teasers, so it is out. It is out, and it, it, you have to subscribe to their network. <clears throat> okay. And everyone was giving me a hard problem, like, oh, man, I'm already subscribed to so much. But, like, this one website, Warrior Poet Society Network, is filled with all kind of stuff about gear information, tactical information, which, I mean, everybody should be, you know, a little bit of breeze to now with the whole 2020 passing and all yeah. this chaos yeah. in the world like yeah. even if it's just to educate yourself exactly because, you exactly. know you can't just lack knowledge you have to be yeah. feeding yourself and then the show is like man even if i wasn't on it it would it, i would be watching it yeah yeah it's a really okay good so, show. so say, say the, the address the website again so it's warrior poet society network you can go through their app or you can go online and then you just sign up and it's ten dollars <throat> monthly you can use the discount code real world and it'll give you ten percent off well, there you go. So you can, if at worst case, if you're going to cheat, be a cheap bastard, get on it for at least one month. Yeah. With you your 10% up. discount, now you're paying nine. Oh, shit. Wait a minute. It's $10, 10%. <laughs> you're paying $9. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do the math real quick. You're paying $9. You can cancel after you do a month. At least you can give it a try. Your support is going for a great fucking cause. And you get to see this dope ass thing that Kendra was a part of. You did it with... Two other girls and two other guys? Or yeah, is it yeah, yeah. Three girls, two guys. Three girls, two guys. Yeah, and how were, not, I mean, you do what you got to do. If you bad mouth, you bad mouth them. How were your partners? How were your, your... Well, it was actually kind of, like, the whole situation kind of reminded me of the UFC Hell Week, which is... Really I was going to say that, but I want to yeah, wait till you were done. Because it was, like, it was very extreme. Because in UFC, we went through every single workout that we would show somebody. Exactly. And then I had the road rash. So then sleeping at night was horrible. And it was just not practical. And showering was difficult. So, you know, here he put us through so many situations that were similar that I think that Hell Week kind of helped me for that. But it was still it was still a really rough experience, but it bonded all of us. Right. And I mean, I think everybody had such a different background that it was like one was a cop and then one was an, an, a mom. She was a little bit older than me. Another one was a mom. She was about the same age as me, but, you know, didn't really work out. And then, you know, another one was a school teacher. He had never shot a gun before in his life. Oh, or, shit. He, yeah. shit. he shot on himself. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was it was so many diverse backgrounds, but we all kind of like where one person was lacking. <clears throat> we all kind of picked each other up. So that was that was really nice. It, it probably would have been 10 times harder and more difficult mentally if it was a competition. And when did that when was that completely done with? Um, we wrapped up like, I want to say like a month or so ago, but okay. it's, it's the episodes are airing every two weeks. Okay. So we're only on two episodes out right now. The next one doesn't air this Tuesday, but the Tuesday after that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm definitely going to take a look at it. I didn't know it was out. Even if I pull that $9 thing, I'm going to fucking go on for a month cause I want to see it and everything else. So that's dope, man. So after all that, obviously you got a bigger reality check now. You realize that if you were really to be in one of these scenarios or really to be on your best um, there's a lot more to, you know, prep with and learn and all that. And I know that you've been getting a lot more into the technical, tactical forces. You said you're about to get your, I don't want to say it wrong. Not Is it bounty hunter license or is it not? Well, that's on the list. That's on the that's list. On the list of the things. But you're already a private eye. Yeah, I just passed that test. <clears throat> you already got obviously arms, um, certifications. You've done the courses and you told me earlier that you're probably, no, you said for sure you're going to be an arms instructor. A firearms instructor, yeah. Before the before the years, mm -hmm. should I say firearms? Am I do I sound like a fucking <laughs> corrupt person who's trafficking goddamn guns somewhere across the world? No, that's the correct term. Firearms, firearms okay. instructor. I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. I was like, damn, why am I saying arms? <laughs> I like tanks and shit. <laughs> um, you're gonna be a firearms instructor before the year's over for sure, and you're getting ready to try to get this ball rolling again with the uh, the foundation, the uh, nonprofit foundation. Now that COVID, well, hasn't, I guess we can say it's simmered down to an extent. I don't know what the fuck's coming up next. We still got, you know, they're talking about the the new break, whatever, that came out in Cali and one in the, the they call it COVID-19, COVID-20. Get the fuck out of here, man. Get this presidential bullshit over with. Get y'all corruption over with. I think there's going to be a lot of craziness after they say who becomes presidency. Like, I think after they name that, there's going to be a spike in, you know, <clears throat> people retaliating or protests or riots or whatever the nonsense is. But I think that at some 
some point in some weird fashion that this is, you know, what it's kind of going to look like until it runs its course. And I think we're just going to have moments of calmness because, I mean, there's not there's not people still riding in our streets like they were about these passionates that they still should be so passionate about. Like, I don't see much on, you know, the timelines and this. I see spikes of things. Right. So, and, <clears throat> and there was a big spike on sex trafficking before. So I'm hoping that I can bring that into the forefront. But I'm also going to get my hands into you know, going back and teaching some self-defense seminars with situational awareness included and, you know, getting to helping people protect themselves. I think that's really, really important in 2021. I agree 100%. To piggyback that, <coughs> excuse me, and I said that a couple of podcasts ago. I'll say it every podcast. And then, hey, anybody doing jujitsu, especially if you're an instructor or you think your instructor would be down for the cause, I would like to be part of a movement, a cause, to help law enforcement become better at jujitsu um i think that the mma community those who us who know it well enough we agree that a lot of these not everyone because you still got your weird racism you still got your emotional guy who should have never been a cop you still got that that one moment was just scary and that's why but minus those a lot of these situations would be handled a lot better if these motherfuckers knew some pretty decent jujitsu nobody's gonna leave your grasps no cracked out guy is gonna leave two cops that are holding them down it's not going to happen, but cops are busy. Some are, some are underpaid and we all know that they're going through their own emotional shit because they're cops. So the people in the jiu-jitsu world, MMA world, I'm willing to donate my time, free sessions to a class of cops on a monthly or weekly basis. As long as law enforcement is willing to mandate that for their law enforcement. If we want to try to come up with some solution to help everybody out, we all think jujitsu is the biggest deal. You don't need to know how to throw hands or kicks, but you guys need to know how to sustain somebody, grab them without choking them to death, putting your knee, you know, against their neck, you know, things that you don't have to do. Jujitsu wise, we know how to do all that shit easy. Um, so uh, that's me trying to give back and, and trying to help situation out. And I think that what you're doing is amazing. Trying to do your own your own part of that. And even though you haven't got it rolling hard again, how can people do what they whatever it is they can, their best interest to try to help you out and be a part of this. Do they just reach out to you, DM you, or do you already have a, a site for the uh, foundation? I do. It's called liberationteam.org. Liberationteam.org? So, mm -hmm, that's the website. And then the Instagram is liberationteamus on Instagram. Um, and then just being a part of the movement and reaching out would probably be any of the first steps because everybody's – qualified in so many different ways everyone's asking me like oh can i help you can i help you? Well, what can you offer can exactly. you offer graphics can you <clears throat> offer you know marketing can you offer funds and then like you i heard on one of your podcasts you were talking about sponsors and fighters like it's not necessarily you know the the max of what you could do it could be the minimal it could be you know following the page you know yeah. sharing the message exactly. and spreading awareness is my ultimate goal so even if you watch the movie and you share it with somebody, you tell somebody about it. Now one person is more aware than the next person is, and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to be like, hey, man, do you know anything about this sex trafficking thing? Right. You know, one of my friends was telling me about it. And now there's another conversation that's born. <coughs> and then the more conversations that are born, the more it shines these lights into these dark areas where these pimps are hiding. You know, and, that, and that's what they're doing right now. They're hiding, and everybody's looking at these girls and gawking at their stories, and they need to revert back to what it is. It's this pimp mentality or it's this you know you know it's just I'm, I'm helping somebody or you know that like it, you have to see these situations for what they are and recognize them and call attention to them because then they're good the pimps are going to be like oh okay well you know it's not as acceptable as it was or it's now it's more out in the <coughs> forefront so now more people are seeing it and they maybe decide to switch professions i don't right. care what they do you know right. but the more the light is brought on the subject, I think the more we'll see some resolution. We'll see some of these numbers go down. Exactly. And I think at the end of the day, we're not saying we can completely fix it, um, make it go away, but we can put a dent in it. Well, I mean, you know? I, yeah, I, I mean, I got a lot of people that support me that believe that there can be an end to it. And that's great. Like, you know, I believe they're my light <laughs> as to where, you know, in this struggle right here, they're the light and I'm the darkness and not necessarily the darkness, but I'm the one that's going to go do the nitty and gritty and, yeah. and be in these situations that, that the these, darker side of it. Yes. I and get then, you. You know, they have this belief that, you know, it'll be pure and I'm, I'm, I, I need them to hold on to that. You know what I mean? Because sometimes doing this work over here, it really drains you. It really, you know, wears on your soul. Like you some and sometimes these, 
people are so brainwashed and they're so they don't have they're, they're scared so you go through all this emotional stuff with them you help them and then they're right back out there so then you're out there doing it again you know but they have this beautiful belief that it'll come to an end and i need them to hold on to it so hopefully you know other people feel like <coughs> that and eventually it does get to that but like you said i'm i'm looking at how can I make this go down? How can I make this Some, Somebody down? else who can help you a lot because I know it's difficult to do these things from a legal standpoint when it comes to actual enforcing something, catching somebody, exposing somebody. Aside from the just awareness part, teaching tactical things, we need the help of the law enforcement. Yes. So yes, yes. To, to all my law enforcement buddies watching, you know, or listening who know me, or if you have somebody who's, connected to law enforcement, especially any type of special task force. doesn't have to be that, by all means. Um, please reach out. It doesn't have to be to me. Reach out to Kendra. By the way, before we forget that, Kendra, you're not going to find Kendra under Kendra Gennaro. Well, you probably may, maybe you will, but her Instagram handle is Hustle Queen. Just, that's just it, right? That's, it's been that for the longest time. She's got an amazing following. Um, but she also has another page for the fitness aspect, right? And that is... Hustle Queen Fitness. Oh, God damn. How did I miss that one? I don't know. <laughs> so Queen <laughs> Fitness. I, I, I didn't know it was that. My bad. Um, so please, guys, anybody who would really like to uh, help out with Kendra's movement in any shape or form, she just mentioned multiple ways of being able to help out. She's not saying it has to be funds. It has, doesn't have to be, you know, 20 hours of volunteering a week. What can you bring to the table to help put this thing together? It, you, there's a lot of pieces to put together in order to make this thing any bit of a success. And marketing and passing the word, law enforcement involvement, tactical teachings, everything. Information. Information. Information is so Teaching important. how to be aware no matter where you are, whether you're a young teenager, you're a mother of a kid and you're at Walmart, whether you're a party animal and you like to go out, whatever it is, awareness, you know, covering your cup, never leaving a drink by itself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all those things. There's just so many layers to it. If you guys think it can help, please reach out to Kendra. Hit her up in any of, any of her handles. I'll probably say her primary one would be the smarter one. But And if you forget, just reach me, and I'll definitely pass on the message because we want to help this. I despise it. It puts a fucking dagger in my gut. It just feels disgusting, especially when you think about the pedophilia, but we're not going to even go there, but we know that those are connections are there, but too. But, I mean, it, that is the connections because a lot of these girls are trafficked from 14 up. Pedophilia is still a child. 14 mm -hmm. is still a child. and. The yeah, but unfortunately, it's a stupid ass movement to try to say, yeah, exactly. They're gonna put it. At the oh end God, of the thing man, and that's just I don't know what we're going to. I, I think that. And I say that too. I'm like, I, who sat around the table that even listened to that statement come out of somebody's mouth and didn't kick him out of the room? I mean, yeah, man. You know, California with that rule that they passed um, to forgive pedophilias on a way lesser charge because so they're acknowledging like, it as an illness. Well, what they're doing too is it, before it was same sex. This was always a law, but nobody, I guess it wasn't, you know, it wasn't advertised. So <clears throat> if they're within 10 years of the, of the victim, it's not, it's not pedophilia. It's okay. Like they're allowing it. So then they changed the other law to be, um, heterosexual relationships as well. So this law had already been there. Like if it was eight and 18, it's okay. <clears throat> so now it was like they had to make it the same for heterosexuals. But I'm like, so who did this law? How come nobody saw this law? How do we allow this law? And then we just review this law and say, let's make it for heterosexuals also. Like why should the, why should there be a 10 year difference? Like, why is that allowed? Like, you know, I don't, it weirds me out talking about this. Yeah. I don't understand any kind of logic behind it. I don't understand why, if you're going to throw all this constitutional bullshit at me, then go ahead, we can argue about it. But I don't understand why can't we just say, hey, this is how we run our fucking nation. And we believe that a kid is not mature enough to make X and Y decisions, alcohol, smoking cigarettes, same way we do that because they are not mature enough to know how to handle, mix that in their lives. Their brain, their frontal cortex hasn't developed enough. Fuck, I tell people all the time in every podcast, yo, don't make no big boy decisions until you're in your 30s. All that 20 shit, have fun with it. I don't give a fuck what it is. Boo love and this and that. Don't have no kid. Don't think that that career is going to be the one. You just don't know until you're in your 30s. That's when you really figure it out. Even fighters peak at their 30s. Women's libido peak at their, their 30s. Everything, you know? So how in the fuck are we entertaining that a kid has the right to decide they want to be a different gender because they heard a stupid-ass song or they see these 
colorful ass things on TV nowadays. You know, it's just, it's mind blowing, Kendra. It's mind blowing. And then the trend starts and then it's just a trend instead of allowing people to grow into who they were naturally or like you would say all the time, let it go organically. organically. If that's who they become, then that's who they are. If that's who they feel inside, but it's not because of outward social pressure. Like, I, I totally agree. And don't inspire somebody to, to fuel what is obviously a sickness. You're telling, if you told, if you told rapists or child molesters, un, unless it was attempted murder, they won't face no more than 10 years at any given point or six years, whatever you want to call. There'll be a lot more. It'll be done a lot more loosely because they're not worried about, you know, facing the consequence. But if you said any child molester on any sort found guilty along with a rapist, it's a mandatory castration or whatever the fuck, it's a mandatory life sentence with no chance for probate, whatever. You just made that shit fucking mind blowing. Dumb motherfuckers would think 20 times before they pull that disgusting ass trigger. It's actually so, 15 years and they're out in 10 for good behavior. Traffickers. Traffickers, that's that's the one for them? Yeah, but I know I've seen, remember, hun, I've been in and out the system way too many times. Mm-hmm. I've seen so many chomos, child molesters, mm-hmm. take plea bargains because the state is always trying to offer a plea. They don't want to waste the state's money. They don't want to waste, waste the county's money. Give them a plea bargain. It was just this. We can't really prove it. We don't want to go to court with it. I'll take it. And they catch four years, six years, and they drop it to a sexual battery or what is it? Wow. It's insane. It's, it's it's ridiculous. I can't say that for the rape thing. I haven't, uh, I've seen maybe one or two rape cases that went to a sexual battery, but all I heard was this, the attacker story. I didn't hear the, the female story. So um, anyhow, that shit stirred me up. Kendra, you're doing amazing things, son. Keep that shit up. I never knew the depths of your story. I didn't. I didn't need to to have the amount of respect that I've always had for you and, and the love that I've had for you. But definitely, you know, hearing all that enhances it to a whole nother level because it's 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 very difficult for people to bounce back from tough situations. I just had somebody. Um, I want to give her a shout out. A whole uh, uh, an old super close homegirl of mine, Holly Holly Mobis. Her real name's Holly Davies. Her married name Holly Mobis. Um. She just hit me up, I think two days ago, texted me on uh, Instagram, and just gave me the sweetest text saying, hey, you're killing it, you're doing awesome, podcasts are great, you don't understand how happy I am to see you here, whatever. And me, I responded, I respond to everybody a little generally with her, I responded a little bit extra, Holly, you don't understand how much that means to me, thank you so much, I really appreciate you and your, your feedback, blah, 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 blah. I don't think she took that like I gave her a standard response, but she went the extra mile and then sent me a long fucking text. And tell me, I hope you understand that when I say that I'm proud of you, I really mean it, Wes. I know a few people who've gone to jail and have had situations like you. And I know what it does to people. And I know how hard it is to bounce back. And they really didn't. And to see how how much you've bounced back and to see what you're doing with your life and the positive message that you're giving out is truly... And she just said all these great things. I damn near teared up. Sent her a big text back. Told her how much I appreciated whatever, whatever. More of the story is, what is that? Mm-hmm. What the fuck? No, that was crazy. You didn't hear that noise? Mm-hmm. Um, the more the story is, people, oh, it's the, the big truck outside. That's why, yeah. Mm-hmm. The more the story is, people don't understand how, how really hard it is to bounce back from traumatic situations. PTSD is as real as it gets. Oh, yeah. and, that, and that goes from veterans who have, if you had one bullet fly by you, you got PTSD. You'll never know what the fuck to do again when you hear, Pew! If you've been in one bad fight and you didn't grow up a fighter, you're going to shell away and never want a conf- conf- confrontation. If you've been touched the wrong way as a young lady, you're probably going to be weird about se- it. There's so many layers to it. A traumatic situation is a real thing, and to bounce back from it is difficult. Us who have done that, we appreciate each other a little bit more. We've been at the bottom, and, and the bottom almost took you back down a couple of times because you were dealing with it through the alcohol and everything else. And to see where you're at right now, hence why I thought about Holly, it makes me proud, man. I'm really happy to see where you at. And I know you got so much more to do because you ain't even really got started. I know there's a I lot, mean, but lot look, more this to is us. Like, yeah, this yeah. is us. We both went through UFC, and then <clears throat> from UFC, it, it kind of forced us to decide what paths we were going to go down for ourselves for Indeed. life fulfillment, you know what I mean? And it's it, it's hard, like you said, to keep pushing and keep going up. And, and you have that stigmatism with you that you kind of is attached to you wherever you go, that jail sentence is attached to you wherever you go. And it's hard to kind of fight people looking at you like that. 
So then when I share my story, it's hard for me to not get people to look at me like, oh, she's a victim and have mm. pity on me because mm. I don't want that. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, yes. right. I, nobody <clears throat> who's known me for the last 14 years, 15 years can say that they knew these things about me because yeah. I went through it. I went through it and I let it better me. You know, I said I was always going to be getting better and getting to a better point in our lives. And, and then look at us. You're, you know, <clears throat> well on your way. I'm super proud of you. And Thank it was like all you. last year, everyone's like, Hey, come do this podcast, come do this podcast. And it was, it was hard enough for me to face what I had buried for all that time. And then I, it was hard enough for me to accept that that was my life that was going to be put out there, but that it was going to be for a greater purpose for somebody else. And then it's hard to step into that role. Like it took me a long time to accept all of these things. Like once you unbury it, you have to go through it and get through That's it right. and get to a point where you're like, all right, this is going to be me. I now can sit in this seat and say that, you know, I survived something like that and feel okay with it. But it was important that I did it. And I didn't know that, you know, I was going to be doing a podcast with you. I saw you like, you know, <clears throat> like a month ago, we said hi and bye. It was two second right. passing. But I've been, everybody's been asking me, hey, do a podcast, do a podcast. And I'm like, oh, I'm not ready. So I feel really comfortable that I was able to do it with somebody who knew me and, and, and I'm honored. walked it with me. You and, know what and I mean? And I really am honored and I appreciate that. I would imagine. And I asked you, you know, how many times have you done? And you told me what you just said. And I was like, wow, you know, it touches me. And I appreciate it, Kendra. I really do. I appreciate you for coming. I, I, I'm totally amazed by your story and what you're doing. And I, I expect to see so much more. We'll, we're definitely going to do a follow-up podcast in the future, maybe before the year closes. And um, bring everybody up to par. I hope everybody listening, reach out to her. Please do what you can. Do your part. Don't forget about going to the website for The Real Tactical World, which was, again, it was called... Warrior Poet Society Network. Warrior Poet Society Network. Don't forget to find Kendra <clears throat> at, her, at her page on Hustle Queen and Hustle Queen Fitness. And also for her fun, go fun, ah, go fun. her nonprofit organization is... Liberation Team US. Liberation Team US dot org, right? That's the Liberation Team US is for the Instagram. Liberation Team org dot org is for the website. Okay, and there you go. People, we all got to do our part to help this world get a little bit better, man. So please do yours. It's 2021. It's a new year. It's another It's another year for all of us to become better people and help get this world out of the, the depths of what it's in because we, we are in a weird place. Um, sometimes we show light, but we got to do extra efforts in order to really get out of it. Um, Kendra, thank you so much, sweetie. I Thank love you, you girl. You Can't so wait much. till we kick it again. Make sure you give your boys a big hug for me. I hope I they will. remember me. They you did. Know? They said to tell you hello. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Good, good. Guys, catch us on the next episode. Thank you for tuning in. Love and peace.